from lesson 9, DC motor basics. So what we're going to learn in this lesson, DC motors and DC generators share much in common. In actual fact, quite often you can swap one for the other and vice versa. And uh, as uh, Graham discovered in 1873, therefore paving the way for the development of these DC motors. So in this lesson, we're going to describe the operating principles and construction of various types of DC motors, just as we had various kinds of DC generators, we have various kinds of DC motors. So, again, if you're following this along in the textbook, it's chapter 14.1 and 14.2 in Electrical Trade Principles by Phillips. So, a DC motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. And of course, a DC generator does exactly the reverse, which we already looked at, turning mechanical energy into electrical energy. DC motors are classified by how their main magnetic field is produced. This gives the same five types for generate, as for generators. That is, we can have a permanent motor magnet, you can have separately excited, and there are three types of field coiled connections called self-excited generators, which are shunt, series, and compound. So our two Bs, permanent and separately excited, and then self-excited, three of those, shunt, series, and compound, being a combination of shunt and series. So here's an example of some DC motors some you may be familiar with and others maybe not. But the first one, this one is a large DC motor. And because DC motors are often used to, because of their ability to uh, have very, very good speed control, especially at low RPMs, you can achieve full output torque. But of course, when they're going very, very slowly, you don't get much ventilation through them created by the fan on the motor, so quite often they have to have a separate fan. So forced ventilation with a built-in fan that we can, um, we can see here. So that's what this is. It's just an extra fan to push some cool air through it if the motor happens to be going very, very slowly, putting out lots and lots of torque, and we're not getting enough airflow through the vents here. You can see the vents. There'll be another one on the opposite side to get airflow through the motor. And you can see this is a, a 40 kilowatt machine. The second one is this 11 kilowatt lift motor. So quite often in electric lifts in buildings for lifting people up and down through the building, they use DC motors because again, it has the ability to be able to slow down quickly break very gently and come to a precise stop every single time and that stopping position is quite repeatable so DC motors quite often used in lift applications and the one that uh, most people are probably most uh, familiar with is the automotive starter motor so this is a starter motor out of average car and normally they operate at 12 volts. And this part here is the motor itself. It then has a gearbox on the front. That's this part here. Ties into a ring gear which engages here that spins your engine around. This little part up here is called the solenoid. It's just a high current switch. We can use just a couple of milliamps of DC to then switch um, quite a large current because these things can use quite up to you know 100 amps plus but of course they only use it for a, a second or two while you've got the starter key pressed in the ignition so they only pull 100 amps for very short periods of time so they're constructed to give a lot of torque but for a short period of time so there's some examples of everyday DC motors or DC machines. 
So DC motors operating principle. Here we have a fixed magnet arrangement with our north pole to the left, our south pole to the right, and we have magnetic flux of course passing between the two poles. We simply pass a current in through our commutator into the armature of the motor and as we do that a little magnetic field is produced and of course on one side that magnetic field will attract and on the other side it will repel and we will end up with rotary motion as one side attracts the other side repels and it pushes the motor around so the outside magnet is called the field so it's the magnetic field and the inside field is produced by the armature so a basic DC motor with a current flowing in the coil produces a magnetic field that interacts with the main field causing the loop of wire or the armature to rotate in the magnetic field and as you can see here it's just called motor effect and as my field here you can see here this is just a wire and the current is coming at me the force of the conductor is going to follow the arrow so the arrow is simply going to force these around in the opposite directions until eventually they come into a situation where they're attracted they get pulled in but by the time they get to the new position the current's been reversed in them and then they get pushed back out pulled in pushed out pulled in pushed out pulled in pushed out as it rotates so we can use a thing called Fleming's right hand rule to determine which way the current is going to flow and our thumb points in the direction of the current in the conductor and the fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field and it's called Fleming's right hand rule so the curl of the fingers points in the direction of the magnetic field and the thumb points in the direction of the current the motor effect which is caused by an electric current flowing in a coil that is free to rotate in the magnetic field of course it's got to be free to rotate sitting on some bearings and wound around an armature but a little bit more of that later on So, here's Fleming's rules. We use the left hand rule for motors and the right hand rule for generators. So, thumb represents force on the conductor, index finger represents the, sorry, pointer finger represents the flux, and the index finger the supplied current in the conductor so of course at the moment we're dealing with motors so we're more interested in Fleming's left hand rule for motors so to find the direction of rotation of a motor simply arrange the thumb and fingers on your left hand so that they are at mutual right angles the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force acting on the conductor and therefore the direction of rotation so force and torque so torque is just a special form of force the force acting on a current carrying conductor depends on the strength of the magnetic field the current in the conductor and the effective length of that conductor it's kind of the exact reverse of what we were doing with generators so that is F equals BIL, where F is the force in newtons, B 
P is the flux density of the field in Tesla. I or L, sorry, is the effective length of the conductor in meters, and I is the current flowing in the conductor in amperes. So the formula is F equals B L I. So again, force is in newtons. B is flux density in Tesla. L is length of the conductor in meters inside the field, and I is the current flowing in the conductor in amps. So here's a little example. An armature has an effective conductor length of 9 meters and is passing a current of 20 amps. The armature conductors are at right angles to the magnetic field, which has a flux density of 0.25 Tesla. Find the force acting on the conductor. So straight away we can list that we've got a flux density of 0.25 Tesla, 9 meters in length, and our I is 20 amps. So we've simply got to apply our formula that F equals VLI, which is going to be 25 times our 9 times our 20, and the answer tells us that we have 45 newtons of force being applied to that conductor when it's sitting in that field. So torque or turning effort is a force that produces rotational motion and it's measured in Newton meters or how much force per meter. That's what Newton meters means. If the force and the diameter of the armature are known, torque can be determined with a nice simple equation. Fork equal, force, sorry, torque equals F times R. Where torque or T is in Newton meters, F is force in Newtons, and R is the armature radius or the diameter divided by 2. But we also have motor back EMF. So as we're rotating our coils through our magnetic field, as they rotate through, of course, another field is produced, and this other field is called back EMF. So the induced voltage in a motor has the opposite polarity to the voltage applied, and therefore opposes the applied voltage. And again, this is simply Fleming's rule, or what we actually call Fleming's law, that a current that establishes a magnetic field, that secondary field will oppose the primary field. So here, the current direction of a motor, left hand rule, and we get rotation as indicated with the arrows. We have current coming towards us at these points. No current here. You can see here no current flowing because we're sitting outside the magnetic field. And then current in the opposite direction. Of course, this is the exact opposite to a generator which uses the right hand rule. So that's on the right hand side. So the induced voltage in a motor has the opposite polarity with the applied voltage and therefore opposes that applied voltage. And we call that the back EMF. So armature current. The voltage applied to cause current to flow in the armature is the difference between the applied voltage V and the back EMF, capital E, lowercase subscript, capital G. If the armature resistance is known, the armature current, IA, can be calculated using Ohm's law. That is, the current in the armature, IA, is equal to the volts applied, minus the back EMF, that's what the E low G means, divided by the resistance in the armature. Just very simple DC Ohm's law. 
So armature current changes with load. Because the peak EMF is produced, is proportional, I should say, to the speed of the armature rotation, if the motor tends to slow down due to increased load, then the back EMF will reduce. This allows the current to flow in the armature, therefore providing extra power and torque needed to drive that increased load. So, best way to look at that is to have a look at a quick example. So here we have 200 volts being applied to a DC motor. The motor shown in the above figure, figure 14.6, has an armature resistance of 0.25 ohms when operating at a moderate load. It takes about 30 amps from the 200 volt DC supply. What is the motor's back EMF? Assume the motor current is taken only by the armature. So again, it's always pays to list what we know, and we know that the resistance of the armature is 0.25 of an ohm. We know the current's 30 amps, we know the voltage is 200, and we need to work out what the back EMF is. That's the question here. That's the question mark. So, our formula, IA equals V minus EG divided by RA. We can change the subject to the formula and make EG the subject to the formula, and that equals V minus IA times RA. Obviously, this is Ohm's law, giving us the voltage inside the armature. And we're simply subtracting it from the voltage applied. So that gives us 200 volts minus 30 times 0.25, we've got a back EMF of 192.5 amps. Step two, find the motor's back EMF. If the load is increased, causes the motor armature current to go to 50 amps. So again, it's now just a matter of putting the 50 amps into the equation, same equation, 200 minus 50 times 0.25 gives us a back EMF. It's now reduced to 187.5 volts and our torque will have increased in the motor because the back EMF has decreased in proportion or as a response to the load. So what about torque and armature current? The force producing torque is due to the interaction of the armature's magnetic field and the main magnetic field. If either field is increased in strength, the force between them will also increase. In other words, be able to carry heavier loads, push things around harder. Because the strength of the armature's magnetic field is proportional to the armature current, torque is therefore proportional to the magnetic flux phi and the armature current. I. So that gives us a nice little formula, T equals K phi multiplied by I amps, or the armature current. Where T is torque in Newton meters, K is a machine constant for a particular type of construction of machine. Phi is the main field flux density in Weber's. And I is obviously the armature current. Machine's constant is given a value that includes factors such as the number of motor poles, how the armature is wound, and the number of conductors. So that's kind of built into the manufacturing process and is always a given. So again, an example the motor that we had previously, 14.6, has a main field flux of 0 0.035 Webers. Calculate the torque delivered by the motor when the armature current is 30 amps A and 50 amps B. Assume machine constant of 100. So again, we've got our phi at 0.35, our current, two of them, one at 30 amps, one at 50 amps. 
and our K at 100 watts the torque. So again, we just simply apply our formula. For the first one, we're going to get a constant of 100 multiplied by our flux density, multiplied by our current at 30 amps, going to give us 105 newton meters. Our second one, of course, nothing's changed except for the current has gone up from 30 to 50 amps. So what would we expect? Of course, our torque has now increased to 175 newton meters. So what about the power output from these machines? The mechanical output power of a DC motor can be calculated in two ways. The first uses an equation based on the machine's mechanical performance, namely torque and speed. So power out is 2 pi nt divided by 60, or nt divided by 9.55. All they've done is taken the constants that uh, are givens, so you know the 2 pi part and the 60 part, and that gives you this denominator of 9.55. So nt divided by 9.55. Where the output power is in watts, power is always, of course, in watts. The speed is in RPM, that's what the 60 is doing in our formula, converting it all to RPM. Torque is in Newton meters. So output uh, approach equation number two. Power output of a DC motor also approximately equals the product of the back EMF and the armature current. This doesn't take into account all the losses in the machine, but it is often accurate enough for our purposes. So power out is simply the EG multiplied by the IA. Again, just Ohm's law, the, um, the voltage multiplied by the current. So the power out is equal to EG, the armature generated voltage, the IA, the armature current. So again, a little example, a motor in the above example has a back EMF of 187.5 or a, an EG of 187, and the armature current is 50 amps find the output, assuming we're going to ignore the losses. So again, it's just Ohm's law, volts times current, and we end up with 187 times 50, giving us about 9,375 watts of power that that motor is capable of delivering. Speed. The speed of a DC motor is directly proportional to its terminal voltage and inversely proportional to the field. We learnt this a little bit earlier. So the speed of the motor directly proportional to its voltage terminal. If the voltage goes up, its speed goes up. If the voltage goes down, its speed goes down. It's also inverse to the proportion of the field. So if the field strength goes up, speed goes down and vice versa. This means there are two ways to increase the speed of a motor. One, you can increase the supply voltage. Two, you can reduce the strength of the field's main magnetic field. So the equation defines speed. So N is equal to 9.55 multiplied by P divided by T. Where speed is in revs per minute or RPM. Power out is in watts. And T is torque in Newton meters. Again, let's do a quick little example. If the motor from the previous example, 14.6, produces 175 Newton meters calculated speed, so we knew from previously its power was uh, 9,375 watts. 
we know we have 175 Newton meters we want to determine n so we know that n is 9.55 multiplied by p out divided by the torque so that's going to be 9.55 multiplied by 9375 divided by 175 and the machine must rotate at 511.2 revolutions per minute or RPM. So let's sum up what we've covered in this lesson. A DC motor has the same construction as a DC generator. They are nigh on identical. Using Fleming's left hand rule to find the direction of rotation of a motor, the direction of current and magnetic flux are known can be determined. When a DC motor is running, the armature produces a back EMF that opposes the supply. That's Fleming's law, and this limits the value of the armature current. When the load on a DC motor is increased, its speed and therefore its back EMF is reduced, causing the armature current to increase. This provides the additional torque to drive the increased load forward. The back EMF of a motor equals its terminal voltage minus the armature voltage drop. And remember we can achieve or find out the armature voltage drop just using Ohm's law if we know the resistance of the armature and we know the current through it. I times R equals V. The speed of a DC motor is directly proportional to its terminal voltage and inversely proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So if you want to speed a motor up, you either reduce its field or you increase its terminal voltage. The output power of a DC motor is approximately equal to the product of the back EMF and armature current. Product just means multiply. So if we multiply the back EMF and the armature current, it'll approximate the power. Power also equals the product of the torque and the speed divided by a constant of 9.55. So that brings us to the end of electromagnetism lesson nine, all about DC motors, how they work, and a few calculations around them.